Well, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, and welcome to the launch of Full Speed Ahead, how to make variable data PDF files that won't slow your digital press. It's our new independent guide with practical advice for anyone in the digital print supply chain. So there's, there's several hundred people on the call today, but we do hope that we'll have time for questions at the end and would invite you to use the Q&A or the chat feature. And I'll do my best at the end to, to read through those. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Martin Bailey, who's our Chief Technology Officer and the author of the guide. He's not only our CTO, but he's also the primary UK expert to the ISO committees maintaining and developing PDF and PDF VT. So without further ado, I will hand over to you, Martin. Many thanks, Jill. Um, I'm going to start by saying that I may be CTO at Global Graphics Software. But actually, a lot of what I'm going to be presenting today is specifically intended to be non-commercial. Um, it's talking about some work we've been doing to, um, in the words of the old prophet, uh, proverb, um, rise, raise the tide so that all boats will rise with it. Um, and obviously, that's something that as an industry, we can benefit from right now. Um, so title is Full Speed Ahead, and it's all about variable data and PDF files. I'm going to start with what you might describe as motherhood and apple pie, the, the, the basics that everyone understands, and then try and show that some aspects of that may not be as broadly understood as everyone thinks they are. So why do I need variable data printing? Well, there are really two classes of that. One is things where the variability is aimed at the end user. Obviously everyone, when you start talking about variable data print, most people think transactional bills and statements, direct mail, direct marketing, whichever name you prefer. Um, but we're seeing an increasing amount of marketing on packaging and labels. We're seeing customized labels, customized product. And the other big category of variable data is for things that aren't aimed at the end user, logistics information, whether that's for guiding your finishing equipment, for warehousing, for shipment, for fulfillment, et cetera, whether it's because you want to do track and trace or anti-counterfeit and therefore you're putting serial numbers and other, other identification onto, onto packaging, um, and, and thinking about mass customization. And I put that mass customization under other uses rather than aimed at the end user because it's becoming a, a different way of manufacturing things as opposed to simply delivering information to the end user. And to give you an idea of what I mean, um, this slide has a couple of screen grabs from a website called redbubble.com, which is a site where artists can upload their, their artwork, their designs, and then anyone in the world can order them on pretty much anything. Um, this is a very small subset of the categories that Redbubble handle, but you can see you know, bedding, bath mats, acrylic blocks, clocks, floor cushions, mugs, spiral notebooks, postcards, um, you know, wall art, etc., etc., etc. And as I said, this is a small subset of what people are starting to do around uh, mass customization. Alongside that, you can put things like um, photo books. That's the, the, the category here that's been around for longest. There's marketing campaigns um, on uh, Coca-Cola, on Nutella, on Marmite. A lot of those are, if you like, done under a pull model uh, rather than the push model because you've got to get the right name on the jar etc there's an awful lot going on in this space so it's important to remember that variable data is no longer just the transactional and direct mail areas that we might be thinking about in other words variable data can be printed with black and white cmyk extended gamut so you can get um, accurate reproduction of a larger proportion of brand colors uh, with metallic inks or cold foiling, with fluorescent invisible security inks, 
with tactile varnishes for haptic effects and for, for braille, for instance, even with laser cutting. So in other words, you can do variable data with pretty much any technique that can produce a visible effect on the piece that you're trying to produce. And that piece can be on paper, on board, on plastic, on foil, on textile and garments, wood, concrete, and on products, because obviously I've just been talking a lot about product decoration, whether that's a, a mobile phone case or anything else. So you can do variable data with pretty much anything on pretty much everything. That's a really broad range. So what do they have in common? If every page or label or carton or t-shirt or I'm gonna say instance, um, just to cover all of those, if every instance is different, then at least some of every instance must be rendered, color managed, half tone screened and delivered from the digital front end, the DFE on the inkjet press to those inkjet heads. And that has to be done at engine speed. Otherwise, that press is not going to run at advertised speed and nobody is going to be happy if that happens. So you've got a lot of work being done with a very clear target speed to achieve. And that can be an awful lot of data. So this is the, the, the only slide that's really geeky in this presentation. So put on your hard hat and I'll try and walk you through it. Each of these rows in the table is an example press and they are deliberately examples. I picked label presses, publication, corrugated, laminate flooring, just because they were the first ones that came to mind that gave me a nice range of uh, speeds and feeds. And for anyone in the, um, in the more commercial space or the sheet fed space, I've also put in a column of pages per minute equivalent so that you can understand how that fits alongside the kind of thing you're doing. Now pages per minute calculation is an art in its own right and everyone does it differently. So those are very deliberately rounded numbers. Let's start at the top. <clears throat> Narrow web label press, 70 meters per minute, that's 230 feet per minute, 330 foot mil wide, 13 inches, uh, that's 13 inches in four colors, just CMYK and at 600 by 600 DPI. It's the equivalent of 330 pages per minute, which is, you know, it's a speed that a lot of sheet fed devices are managing to achieve as well. And that has a data rate of 0 0.9 gigabytes per second. If you take that same press and you add orange and green because you want to use an extended gamut, you want to get accurate reproduction of a larger proportion of brand colors, and you add white because it's in labels and some of your stock may be off white or you may be printing on, uh, on clear substrates, then it's the same pages per minute equivalent, but now your data rate requirement to feed that press is 1.6 gigabytes per second. And I should say that these figures are all uncompressed, eight bit per pixel uh, data rates assuming every page is different because we found over the years that that is a very good way of representing the load on the, the ripping, the color management, after and screening, et cetera, in, in the DFE. Now, if you upgrade that same press to 100 meters per minute, 330 feet per minute, instead of the, the, the slower speed on the first line, and you increase it to 1200 by 1200 DPI, that's, you're now up to 480 pages per minute equivalent and 8.6 gigabytes per second. You can think at this point, well, this first line, the 70 meters per minute CMYK is perhaps what you might have bought last year or the year before, but none of the vendors are sitting still. All of the vendors are scrambling to say, we've got to do better reproduction of brand colors. We've got to add white or varnish. We've got to go faster because all of our competitors are doing so and because that's what the customers want. Um, and we've also got to go up to 1200 dots per inch in at least one dimension because that means that I can reproduce small vector graphics, things like small text in, in Western script or uh, medium sized text in Far Eastern, in Japanese, Chinese, etc. 
Um, so that's what everyone's doing. And it's an obvious thing for the product marketing manager at a uh, at an inkjet press vendor to, to demand that, that the company does. But if you look over here at the data rates, that means you've gone up from 0.9 gigabytes per second on last year's press to 8.6 gigabytes per second on next year's press. The data rate requirement has gone up by a factor of nearly 10. And the engineers will be sitting there scratching their heads and saying, how on earth do we make that happen? And actually, they'll, they will do so because those engineers are very good at that kind of thing, but it's an obvious challenge for them. Now, those first three presses, I'm, I'm assuming the narrow web label press here is UV ink, which means, which is why the 100 meters per minute is about the top of the range I'm talking about here. Now, if you step into water-based aqueous inks, let's talk about a publication press at 200 meters per minute because you can go a lot faster with water-based. It's a lot wider because that's how you get the throughput and because if you're in publication, you need, you really want a, a width of um, a double page spread. Um, but four colors at the moment is, is plenty for publication because there isn't that push to get the brand colors exactly right. And 1200 by 600 is a fairly common resolution at the moment. So that's 4.3 thousand pages per minute and 30 gigabytes per second. I could go through the details on the corrugated press. This is fairly typical of, of those presses at the moment. 47 gigabytes per second. Laminate flooring press obviously tends not to be aqueous. You get into some really weird ink types here. But again, this is the kind of, of speeds and feeds and, and ink colors that we're talking to press vendors about. Now, I can point at all of these and say, oh, look, 56 gigabytes per second. But if you're anything like me and you're sitting in an audience for a presentation and somebody um, presents a big number, you think, oh, that's a big number. And it kind of goes over your head until you get forced to compare it with something else. And what I find useful to compare these against is how many SSDs, how many solid state drives would I need to be reading from in parallel in order to get that data rate from a disk and to the inkjet press heads? Well, most solid state drives are quoted as having a sustained read speed of something like 500 megabytes per second or half a gigabyte per second. Don't be misled by all the stuff around um, five gigabytes per second because that's the interface rate not the sustained read speed so even this slowest press on here if it were reading uncompressed 8-bit data from disk would need nearly two solid state drives just to produce that data rate you get down to the bottom of this list and you need 100 times 110 in other words 11,000. SSDs just to get that data rate read off disk. Now, obviously there's lots of things you can do about it, that in the DFE, but that for me, it helps get things into context and, and helps people understand the scale. And, and by the way, I should point out that we do have a data rate calculator on our website. Um, if you're into this kind of numbers and want to understand them, and it allows you to calculate data rate from web speed and width or from pages per minute or from sheet size or from square meters per minute or for from um, head firing rates and one quick final comment on here that is that a lot of people say to me oh i've got 4 k 4k tv now streaming stuff off the web and gosh that's really fast well it's really fast for a domestic environment but at the consuming end it's tiny. It's another you know, 100 times slower than the SSDs. Um, but at the, at the um, broadcast end, if you're doing video on demand, then actually these numbers here do put some of the faster presses at a very similar data rate to the servers that people like Netflix are running to deliver the, the data out to, out to the homes. So we are really talking about big data here. 
obvious question, how on earth does the digital front end on a digital press deliver that? Well, an obvious answer is that DFE has to be highly optimized. It has to use both very fast components and build very efficient system engineering around them. Where do you, where do you store data? How do you get data from one component to the next? How do you deliver it out to the heads, et cetera? But even if it's highly optimized, it can't possibly deliver that kind of data rate unless it understands the variable data in the job and has methods to touch each piece of that data as little as possible. In other words, to try and render bits once and then print them multiple times wherever that's possible. But it also helps, and this is really coming to the meat of today's presentation, it also helps a lot if the incoming job is well structured. PDF is a very valuable format for, uh, for graphic arts, for labels and packaging, and, and is expanding into industrial print precisely because it's a fabulous format for delivering very graphically rich designs. Obviously, very graphically rich is one of those things with, that the designer is jumping up and down and, uh, about, and the the marketing um, manager at a brand, for instance, is, is jumping up and down saying, yeah, this looks fabulous. This is exactly what I want. But on the other hand, the richer it gets, the longer it takes to process in the rip. But it's worth remembering that you can achieve that same graphically rich design, that same visual appearance in a multitude of different ways inside a PDF file. And some of those are much easier for the DFE to handle at speed than others. So let's look at the real world impact of poorly structured PDF files. Let's imagine a 10,000 page job, and I'm talking pages even though a lot of sectors printing with PDF don't talk about pages. PDF files have page objects in them, so I'm talking about page objects, or A4 or US letter equivalent areas. So I've got a 10,000 page job um, that might be 20,000, 40,000 postcards. It might be 100, 120,000 labels. It doesn't really matter what. If the DFE takes half a second longer on every page because of the inefficiency of, of how that PDF has been constructed, that adds 90 minutes for the whole job. Essentially 10,000 times half a second is 90 minutes. But if you were printing it on 120 page per minute press, it should only take 83 minutes at engine speed anyway. So half a second longer per page doubles the amount of time it takes to prepare that job to print. And that may mean it doubles, to, doubles the, the amount of time it takes to get the job through your print room, your press room. If you look at the, at the top end of scale, not really the top, but we go higher than this, but um, if you've got a 1 million page job, then if you only add an extra one hundredth of a second per page, that adds two and a half hours to the total processing time. But if that press is six and a half thousand pages per minute, which is you know, in between the um, publication and corrugated press examples I gave a couple of slides ago, it should only take two and a half hours anyway. So. 10 milliseconds extra per page doubles the amount of time it takes to get that job out through the press. And in the real world, where the technology hits the money, for the printer, the converter, the manufacturer, the person running the press, that means your overall capacity can be reduced because a job can take longer on press than it should do. And if you haven't taken that into account, it means you can miss deadlines for delivery. If you have taken it into account, it may mean you've had to put your costs up or your prices up because your capacity is not as high as you really wanted to get out of that press. Your capacity is not as high as it would have been if the press were running at advertised speed. The other end of the contract, the buyer, the brand owner, etc. Again, if capacity is reduced and deadlines are missed, then jobs may be delivered late. And that may mean that follow on deadlines may be missed. If you imagine, for instance, a direct mail piece inviting people to take advantage of a special offer, 
if those pieces are delivered late and there is an expiry date printed on them, they're not much good after that expiry date. And it also means that printing may cost more because the print site can't guarantee that they can do their full capacity. Not good things. So who can make a difference? Um, here's a very generalized design of what a variable data workflow looks like. Obviously, I've been talking about everything from transactional through commercial, through labels and packaging, wide format, industrial. So every one of those is likely to be different. And even within a sector, you'll see a lot of difference. But this is generalized, and I think you can probably extrapolate from it to, um, to most situations. And the vertical dashed lines there, by the way, are where jobs may be passed from one company or one division or one department to another. So let's start with the brand owner on the left hand side. They decide what the piece has to look like, what, or rather what the, the, the goal of the piece is, and they, and they have the final decision on what it looks like. And although they could make a difference to the efficiency of printing the job, we're going to assume that what they say goes. What they say is gospel. It's non-negotiable. If they say it must look like this, then it must look like this. Because the key part of print production is you've got to produce the right visual appearance. And it's the brand owner or whoever it is up front who's defining what the job will look like, needs to look like, um, who defines what that visual appearance is. But after them, you've got a bunch of, of artists and operators who can affect the efficiency of a PDF file that reaches the DFE. And you've also got a bunch of software engineers developing things that can affect the efficiency of that PDF file. So in fact, pretty much everyone who touches the PDF or the software that touches the PDF can make a difference to the efficiency. And wouldn't it be great if every single person in that workflow, both the artists and operators and the software engineers, could focus on making a better PDF file. The obvious question then is, how does everyone know what to do? And that's why we've just produced a new guide called Full Speed Ahead, because it's specifically designed to help both the artists and operators and the software engineers understand what things in a PDF file can slow the DFE down and with some hints as to how, to how you avoid making that slowdown. And it covers a lot of the stuff I've been talking about today. Now, what is variable data printing? Where is it used? File formats and technologies, why optimization matters. Um, and then it dives into a lot more detail about how to make an efficient PDF file for variable data print. Um, exactly what I've just talked about and who can make a difference. Um, there's some annexes, uh, some appendices on relevant standards around PDF and a glossary to help the rest all make sense. So we've got this book and, and, and the, the next obvious question, because I'm trying to answer a series of obvious questions, is how do I get hold of it? Well, it's available now from our website at um, globalgraphics.com, full speed ahead, as it says on there. You may also have noticed that along the bottom of these slides, there is a list of logos um, from HP Indigo, what they think, Digimark, Delphax Solutions, Rackamy, Kodak, Hybrid Software, and HP Pagewide Industrial. Those um, companies have very generously sponsored us in developing and, and making this uh, guide available. The plan had been that some of those sponsors would be printing the guide and giving it away at Drupal next month. Now, obviously that's not happening anymore. And um, there aren't that many print trade shows even towards the end of this year that are big enough and long enough for some of the bigger presses to be installed and running on the trade show booths. So we're talking to our, to our um, sponsors at the moment about when we might be able to get on to the point of being able to print copies. But 
Some of those sponsors are also making the guide available already uh, to their customers and partners and through their websites. And finally, um, we had also intended to be making printed copies of the guide available to universities and other academic institutions and um, organizations um, running apprenticeship courses and that kind of thing um, in July. And again, you know, now is not a great time to be able to get jobs printed that are not involved with um, packaging and labeling in particular. Um, so that isn't happening for the moment. We do intend to come back to that. But in parallel with that, obviously, universities, academic institutions can con can download the guide from um, the, the link at the top there. Um, but we're also making some special arrangements available to allow those organizations to, dis to distribute the digital copy to staff and students, etc. If you're from one of those organizations and you would like to be involved or like to understand more, please contact marketing team at globalgraphics.com as it says there on the slide. Which brings me to um, my final slide. And I'd like to express my thanks again to all of our sponsors for their support. They're all in different spaces in the market. They're all addressing different use cases for variable data. If you think back to that generalized workflow, you'll see they, they fit into a lot of the places where the software vendors and, and the vendors themselves um, can make a difference to, to how efficiently variable data jobs print. Um, so we're, we're grateful that our sponsors wanted to help to address the data rate challenges that printers, converters, and manufacturers are facing today. And we'd also, all of us, including the other sponsors, like to, to thank our media sponsor, what they think for supporting this initiative and for promoting the guide on their various platforms. You'll see on the screen is my email, martinbailey at globalgraphics.com. Um, if you have any questions that are specific to the guide or specific to me, I would be very happy to receive them. Um, if you've got any more general uh, queries, then info at globalgraphics.com is the right place to go. And again, I put the download link, globalgraphics.com, full speed ahead on there. And with that, I'm going to throw open, throw the floor open to, to questions. Thanks, Martin. So we'll just give people a, a few minutes to uh, have a think about the content and uh, we'll see. There are no questions at the moment, but um, we know from experience that that will change. <laughs> <laughs> I see quite a few people are uh, downloading the, the, the guide already, which is great. And still no questions. Martin, you've obviously done a very good job. <laughs> Maybe people happened. will have questions when they've read the guide. And yes, uh, no problem with uh, asking questions if you've downloaded it and read it. And if there's anything unclear in there, let me know. Uh, so I, I do have one question now. Uh, hang on. Um, so uh, somebody is saying, well, when will there be a press release that's going to go out shortly? Thank you for that. Um, is there a distinction between static PDF and dynamic editions or fully dynamic PDF? Not really. Now, obviously, there are, there are some optimizations that are performed inside a DFE that can be used where you've got a combination of static and, and, and dynamic, where you've got, for instance, a background and then some variable data over the top of it. Um, and those optimizations can't be applied in the same way to a job that is fully dynamic, a photo book or, or, or anything like that. Um, but a lot of the same guidance around things like optimizing the, the resolution for images that are gonna be used applies to both. In fact, in some ways it applies more to the fully dynamic case mm -hmm. because you're more likely then to have variable images. If you've got the uh, mixed static and dynamic, usually variable images are either fairly small or there's a very small number of them. In the fully dynamic, every page completely different, then the RIP has to process or the DFE has to process every, the whole of every image and therefore getting those properly optimized is really important. 
Thanks, Martin. I have another question here asking whether, whether um, people are free to print, bind and distribute copies and that privilege is reserved to sponsor organisations who have distribution rights. Uh, we are looking at um, special arrangements for educational institutions, as Martin has uh, indicated. Another question then. So is this guide targeted more to designers or to technical teams? Actually to both. Um, we've, we know there are a lot of designers out there who um, work hard to, to follow best practice in creating their jobs. Um, and being able to do that has become a distinguishing feature for, for some designers. Actually understanding print has become a distinguishing feature for, for some designers. So there's quite a lot in there about how you can construct um, your, your job in, in design or whatever, um, or in your composition tool um, to, to make it as efficient as possible. But exactly that same data is also valuable to people at the composition vendors writing the software, for instance. There is a small section that is primarily addressed at the software guys because Quite often, they're the only people who can really control things like whether fonts are subset, etc. Another question, Martin. Um, can you comment further on the logistics use case and why that is changing now? Um, a lot of logistics variable data has historically been done using coding and marking engines. Um, Coding and marking engines are outside the goal of this guide, primarily because most of that stuff doesn't use PDF. And this is very specifically aimed at PDF. Um, but we are seeing a convergence between the kind of marking that has historically been done on a coding and marking printer with printing of the rest of the design, simply because if the rest of the design is printed digitally, there is far more opportunity to to merge that merge the coding and marking into the same print run and also because digital printing for things like label and labels and packaging is often done closer in time and in space to the filling line than for instance using flexo offset so we're seeing that we're seeing more and more of the things that have historically been done in coding and marking being done in the same print pass as the rest of the graphics. Thanks, Martin. Another question. Uh, what is your experience with PDF software optimizing the PDF before ripping brackets when the document composition cannot be influenced? Close brackets. Um, it can be a really useful way of doing things. Um, in, in fact, if I step away from the non-commercial for just a moment, um, we launched a, a product called uh, Streamline Direct uh, the week before last, which does exactly that. Um, and in cases where you're simply getting arbitrary PDF coming into your um, print shop workflow or your, your converter workflow or manufacturing workflow, then that can be a really, a really useful thing to do. But there are, there is more opportunity to optimize further if that work is done earlier in the, in the overall design and, and production workflow. Um, just to take an example, if you've got a mixture of static and variable data, then best practice is to put all of the variable data on top of all of the static data, at least per label or postcard or whatever inside the design. Um, and in DFE optimization, we'll often move things around in the Z order, in the order in which things are encoded into the file, in order to make that um, more effective. But there's a limit to how much a DFE optimization can do to reorder things safely, knowing that it's not going to affect the visual appearance. Whereas if that same work is done by the designer, they're looking at it on screen and they're saying yes this looks right and they have more opportunity to tune things better earlier in the workflow okay uh 
I think this might be the last question. Oh no, another one has popped in. Uh, what is the benefit of using Harlequin Direct together with PDF-VT in terms of ripping performance? That's a question, question just come in. Yeah, I was trying not to talk about Harlequin and, and global graphic software specific stuff in on this call. Maybe we can take um, that offline. So, mm. so if that questioner would like to send a mail to either Martin Bailey at globalgraphics.com or info dot info at globalgraphics.com, we can we can take that. Mm -hmm. But I but I will say one thing. I I've already mentioned Streamline Direct, and Harlequin Direct is a highly optimized, high speed um, approach to help inkjet press vendors or digital press vendors build their solutions um, and, and to get the best possible solutions out and available to, um, to the printing companies. Um, and you might think that, that these things contradict each other, they, they counteract each other. Um, I would say I talked about the data rate barrier, the, the step up from last year's label press to next year's label press and, and an increase in data rate of nearly 10 times that the engineers at that press vendor have got to find a way of delivering to the inkjet heads. We regard that as a sufficiently big challenge for the printing companies and for the, uh, for the press vendors that we're attacking it from multiple different angles. So Harlequin Direct is one, going to the um, inkjet press vendors. Streamline Direct is another, which may be added on to Harlequin Direct, which does that optimization from an arbitrary PDF to an optimized PDF. Um, and full speed ahead is essentially a third thing aiming at a different point in the workflow in order to um, help the, the buyers and the designers help the inkjet press vendors to help the printing companies to deliver things at, at full capacity through those devices. So they're all aiming in at the same in the, in the same direction, but I should point out full speed ahead is deliberately not specific to, to products built around our Harlequin rig. It even has things in there that are specific to other people's variable data rips to make sure that, as I said, we're the rising tide that, that raises all boats. Thanks, Martin. Good point. Um, and I think we can wrap up there just to answer a couple of general questions. Um, a press release will be going out shortly and also this presentation and the recording will be made public in the sense that I can email you uh, all people who've participated a link to the recording so that you can play it again. But as Martin has just said, this is an independent guide with information for everybody involved in the digital print supply chain. So. We, uh, we hope that you enjoy reading it. And thank you very much again for taking part today. And with that, I will close the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.